Hi and welcome to the We Are Zion Sermon Podcast. We are a local church based here in Chennai, India. I'm Christine, your host. We are so glad you are here and our hope is that this will encourage, inspire and instill fresh faith in you. We continue with our series, The Detox. Here's Pastor Geshom with today's message. It's such a joy and honor to be bringing God's word to you this week. Even as we started this new series called Detox, and as we go into the second part of it, I'm so encouraged that God is working in and through us. This entire series is all about repentance. And today, if there's one thing that we need to do uh, in our lives is to repent of so many things, so many past things that we probably have done, God will bring to remembrance. Or probably in our journey of life, as we continue every day, year on year, there'll be certain areas and habits that we think are good for us, but may not be right in the sight of God, that God would want us to bring about repentance. And so even as we look into this entire series called Detox, let's just look back as to what we saw last week. We saw that uh, sin is the very nature that we are born with. When we come into this world, it's part of us. And, you know, at the end of it, we came to the conclusion last week that sin is a condition, but repentance is ongoing. It's something that we will have to do as long as we're living in this earth because we're just human beings who are frail and who need God's strength every step of the way. And oftentimes we fail to acknowledge that. We also saw that even as we follow Christ, even as we've accepted him as Lord and personal Savior, even as we call ourselves Christians, we can put ourselves into two categories. We can either be pretending Christians or we could be performing Christians. Even as we continue on with the second part of the series, I've titled this as Real Repentance. Today, the word detox is used so much. In fact, um, I personally am not a person who exercises a lot like my wife, but I strongly believe that, um, you know, uh, because of my WhatsApp status, you know, I, it might appear on the screen right now. I mean, you would notice that I've always from day one, ever since I joined WhatsApp, probably like 10 years back, I've kept it at the same status as at the gym. And and now I found this cool emoticon, which kind of like shows me of how I really am when I'm at the gym. I uh, It's a joke in the house because I've taken membership so many times in different gyms and I failed to continue at it. But today, the more I was actually preparing on this topic... Uh, I was reminded looking at that WhatsApp status that it cannot just be a one-off thing. Detox of our soul, detox of our spirit, which happens where God really wants to renew us, cannot just be a one-off thing where we just say, you know what, 10 years back I repented. No, it has to be a daily thing. Uh, One of the cool features that actually remained, I think it got carried over from all our messenger chats and everything. As we moved on to different forms of messaging, when we came to WhatsApp, Uh, One of the key ways in which we could notify others who are trying to reach us of what we are currently, in fact, it will say when I'm I'm busy or it will say I'm driving or it will say at the gym. These are different statuses that we could put so that someone could uh, know why we are not getting back to them or where we are at at that particular point of day. But as Christians, are we actually changing that status every day to say, God, I'm taking this time to repent. And even as we do this series, we'll soon realize that what we do in terms of repentance will be personal we'll start repenting even on behalf of our family, most of us. And then that eventually leads us to repent and intercede and, you know, ask for forgiveness on behalf of the land. It just doesn't stay with us. So we need to find our time and our place of when we can detox. When we repent and when we say that this is a daily thing, we are saying because we need to seek the face of God every day. Why do we seek the face of God every day? We saw last week, it's not something that we work towards. It's not something that, you know, we strive towards uh, seeing God. God has called us as his children. We are his sons and daughters. Nothing can change that. Today, um, today when, uh, when I look at my kids, they don't have to strive hard to please me. They just have to live the life that God's given them to their fullest. They don't, their their status of uh, my son or my daughter doesn't change. They are my son and my daughter. The minute they came into this world, they are mine. The same thing, God has created us in his image and we are his. Our status will never change, but the place where we stand and call him father will change. Whether we call him from a repented heart or are we standing from a place of not understanding and you know having the heart of stone and saying, you know what, God, I'm here, but I, you know what, I can just offer my prayers to you, but I won't change. Today, even as we look into real repentance, 
if there exists real repentance, there also has to be something which is not real. And so I've termed that as uh, the knockoff repentance. Uh, I'm reminded about this, I think 10 years back when we all took a family trip, we went to Thailand and, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of the trip, as part of that tour package, we actually had to go through this electronic street where we had to see all the different electronics that were in display. And I uh, remember it so clearly because me, my brother, my brother-in-law, all of us were walking and that's when um, the iPhone had just come out. I think the second edition of the iPhone had come out. And we were walking through those streets and the guys were actually selling us knockoff versions of the real iPad and the real uh, iPhone. And when we saw it, we were like, wow, this is so cool. Everything looks, you know, so uh, so close to the real one. In fact, the packaging, the way it looked. And so this guy opened it and then, you know, he turned it on for us. And then we could see that this was a complete knockoff. Today, when I call it a knockoff repentance, it's because we have come to this place where we get so used to our prayers, where we get so used to actually... Um, meeting with God, that it comes down under a time constraint. And that's when we have these knockoff repentance where we actually don't really mean what we say. And the reason why I've termed this as knockoff repentance is because uh, any form of a knockoff actually follows a template or there is a skeletal framework in which it's actually done and made. Uh, today, uh, just a few weeks back, we had uh, Apple launching their new OS and what is expected to come this year in terms of the market. And immediately you can see uh, case manufacturers and everyone come out with their own version of uh, what they might think could be the new phone. And if you notice where they all draw that from are from all the patents that have been submitted. They take all those CAD drawings and they decide, okay, this is what can possibly come. These are the features that could be included. Even as people outside are using these templates to create knockoffs, we have found our own templates when it comes to repentance and actually approaching the throne room of God. We don't spend enough time because we're scared. If we don't stick within the temp template, we might, you know, uh, God might show us something else and we might have to go off track and ask repentance. And that could be a different road, which we really don't want to go down. Or we, it might go beyond the two or three minutes that we're spending time in prayer. Repentance brings about change. And when that change happens, it's because we can draw more closer to God so that God can reveal more of himself and so that we will be able to live the life that he's called us to live here the fullest. The way I see it is in repentance, it brings about a change holistically in our walk with God. Oftentimes, it, uh, you know, we are so okay with these template prayers of repentance that we say and it's like walking on a treadmill where you're in the same place but you've just you know, worked ourselves and we think you know what, we've done our due diligence. God wants us to change. Even as we look into what this knock of repentance could look like, I would like to read from Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. It goes on to say, You'll never find choice fruit hanging on a bad, unhealthy tree. And rotten fruit doesn't hang on a good, healthy tree. Every tree will be revealed by the quality of fruit that it produces. Figs or grapes will never be picked off thorn trees. People are known in the same way. Out of the virtues stored in their hearts, good and upright people will produce good fruit. But out of the evil hidden in their hearts, evil ones will produce what is evil. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. I would like to keep this as the base of our entire sermon today. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. Today, even as we go into looking into the knock of repentance, we will see that it, it comes from a place of being remorseful, where we are, you know, we, we've done something bad, we are highly guilty, and yet we make it all about us. We do not actually think that we've hurt someone else. Being remorseful is like we take the blame completely on ourselves. And at the end of it, we personally don't want the outcome to change when we are remorseful. We want to be in control of it. We want to make sure, you know what, uh, I'll feel sorry now, but I don't want the outcome. I don't want uh, the direction which I've taken to change. Oftentimes, it's uh, like us correcting our kids. You know, um, we as parents have those moments when we, you know, blast them and we come out with this ridiculous punishment. To our kid, more than being guilty and sorry for what they have done, they are so scared of that ridiculous punishment. 
you know, off lately because of our kids staying at home with this whole lockdown. The punishment that comes easiest to our mouths is, you know, you can't watch TV or, you know, or you can't go out to play with your friends. And so for our kids, those are the two biggest things. And sometimes as a father, I kind of like go the extreme and I say both those punishments are valid. And you'll notice that uh, immediately, not even like two, three minutes, uh, my youngest will come and he'll say, you know what, uh, daddy, I'm sorry, but can I watch TV? You know, his main focus is to f- make sure the end outcome is not changed. His end outcome, you know, I'm sorry right now. I'll say sorry. In fact, I'll, you know, we tell them, you know, say sorry to each other. But the end outcome is, can we still go out to play or can we still watch TV? Many a times we are remorseful and we forget that God might be the one who we are supposed to ask sorry from. We just make it about ourselves and we take control over that. The second form of a knock of repentance, which actually leads us from being remorseful, is immediately with our words, we come up with these solutions which we itself can't keep. And I would put that under the word called resolution. We are in the month of July in 2020. Let's go back to 31st night, 2019 in December. How many of us would have made so many resolutions? You know what, some of us would have been like, I will read God's word. You know, I will uh, learn a bit of painting or I will learn this new thing or I'll be more encouraging of others with my words or I will be uh, more cheerful in situations. We would have had so many resolutions or I will eat right. You know, I would uh, cut down on, you know, chips or I would cut down. We would have made so many resolutions for the betterment of ourselves. But today... How many of you can say that those resolutions are out of the window? We would have lasted in maybe max, you know, seven days, 14 days. Some of us would have made that decision even, you know what, I'm going to detox every month or I'm going to go to the gym every day. But we are struggling and we strive hard to stick to those resolutions. And oftentimes we feel bad about it. And it's like us when we come and we say, God, I'm really sorry, you know, but next time, you know, I'll make sure I don't do it. You know, we rely on our strength. Our resolutions are dependent on our strength. And we don't want to let go of that because we feel so strongly convicted that we can be the change that we need to be in our own life. But resolutions do not bring about a real repentance. These are all template forms in the sense it, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you actually uh, use templates, but I am a big uh, user of templates in, in the line of work that I do. Even when it comes to editing a sermon like this, there is a template, there is a skeleton thing in which I put it in. And from there on, I work. Templates oftentimes boxes within the four walls. They don't allow us to expand. We tend to become too comfortable over a period of time. We won't be, uh, we won't allow any change because it becomes us moving out of our comfort zone. Repentance every time. If you see the David is a superb example when it comes to repentance. Every time he felt like he sinned and he's done something wrong in God's eyes, the first thing that he does is he goes to God's feet and he just repents. And the repentance looks different every time. And that is the real repentance that we need to exhibit. So today, when we look at real repentance, What does real repentance look like? Being remorseful and having a resolution, all that are small aspects of repentance. But the real repentance when it comes is directed towards God and it's not about me. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, which we read even last week. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. Reading from the NIV version of verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And the death mentioned here is spiritual death. Our prayer is that we'll be consumed by godly sorrow. Godly sorrow that will lead us to real repentance. Today, a lot of us want to have the real deal when it comes to anything in life. Be it a relationship with a friend, a relationship with your spouse, or anyone around, you want to have a real relationship. You don't want something that's fake. You don't want something that, you know, is just satisfying you or just like, you know, uh, is just, it, you want something real. In fact, today it's gone to everything. We want, you know, in our food, we are so careful to make sure everything is real in it. You know, there are no uh, additives added in. We, we are so careful of everything around us But we often forget that we are not being real with the one who's created us. 
So even as I said, real repentance directs us towards God. It's because God knows everything. You know, oftentimes we talk to ourselves and because we keep talking to ourselves, we somehow come to this understanding that that is reality or we know what's best. But God who's created knows everything. Even when we come before him and place a request and a petition or, you know, even when we come before him to repent, he weighs it. He knows. And that's what I want to take from this beautiful psalm of Psalm 51 where David has done this sin where he's taken another man's wife and he's um, made her pregnant and Nathan the prophet comes to you know instruct and you know tell David what he's done is wrong and he writes this beautiful psalm of repentance reading from Psalm 51 verses 1 to 4 it goes on to say have mercy on me O God because of your unfailing love because of your great compassion blot out the stain of my sins wash me clean from my guilt purify me from my sin for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. Reading again verse 4. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. David knew who to direct his repentance towards. He knew he had sinned. He knew he had done something wrong and he knew who he had done it against. Even before he probably would have gone in and, you know, really repented even to Bathsheba, maybe. But before he did all that, he knew he had upset his creator. Today, are we willing to go and repent to God in all honesty? Bear it before him. There's this beautiful parable in the New Testament where Jesus says, uh, which we will read in a few minutes now, where it brings out the depth of honesty. We can only be real with ourselves. We can't be real for others. And that's what God wants. When God actually sees us repenting, he wants us to see the real deal in us. Reading the parable from Luke 18 onwards, it goes on to say, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm reading from the Amplified Version again, verse 13. But the tax collector standing at a distance would not even raise his eyes towards heaven, but was striking his chest in humility and repentance, saying, God be merciful and gracious to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you, this man went to his home justified, forgiven of the guilt of sin and placed in right standing with God rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself, forsaking self-righteous pride, will be exalted. I've highlighted in this amplified version, forsaking self-righteous pride will be exalted. Many times we think we are righteous. We, we have that attitude in us where, you know, we feel like we are on a pedestal you know, above others. Let's not forget in this Christian walk, we are all living in glass houses. We cannot judge others harshly. We cannot be the one who actually pass judgment over them. That's up to God. We all have to look at whether we are living our own lives well. I love how this tax collector just goes there and it says beautifully, it says, in humility and in repentance, he was saying, God be merciful and gracious to me. He knew who to direct it to. He didn't go to God and say, God, you know what? I have done this. I've done that. I've given my tithe here or I've given this offering here. I've given this. I've gone and volunteered here. No, God knows all that. God knows what we do. God, in fact, weighs always. It goes on in the New Testament. It's interesting. Jesus says he weighs the intentions of our heart. That's scary because oftentimes in my life, I've realized my intentions are not on the right track. I actually do certain things so that I can get something else. 
or I can get that other favor out of this other person. Or, you know, if I do this, that one day I can actually have them on my speed dial to actually call and say, hey, I need a favor. But what are our intentions? When it comes to repentance in front of God, are we willing to say, God, I've messed up. In front of you, I've, I've done this completely wrong. I'm reminded of this incident in Mumbai where uh, our son was going for his tuitions and um, when we actually had to go pick him up, he had lied to his teacher and the teacher actually like, you know, took it out on us by blasting us. And we came home and we had really given a piece of our mind to us oldest. And uh, at the end of it, um, he came back and he really apologized. He apologized and he told us the real reason and the whole story behind it. And it broke my heart uh, because I knew that I had uh, been really hard on him. But one thing which actually defined that moment was the way in which he came and apologized. The way in which in all honesty. And, you know, at that point as a father, I didn't care whether, you know, I, I was just willing to accept that apology. I wasn't, you know, there to, you're my son who I would not, you know, who you've let me down. No, not, none of that. So even when we look to God, can we come in all honesty? Because God wants that. Today, David, the Bible says he was a man after his own heart. It's because he was connected to God. He knew everything was directed. For a guy who wrote so many Psalms, who actually, you know, found God in everything. If you read the Psalms, you can see he talks so much about God in the river that runs. He talks so much about God and the beauty that is seen around. He saw God in everything. And so his only main focus was if he upset God, he knew that he couldn't see God anywhere else. He didn't want that image to change. He wanted that connection to always be there. So that's why he goes back to God and says, God, I am sorry. Even as David repented, he was unafraid to face the consequences. For him, the consequences didn't deter him to actually go in front of God. David was only scared that he might lose out on God, that God will forsake him. That was only his concern, not the consequences, because he knew for what he had done wrong, he had to face it. He had to go through it. And God was with him even through that. He even worshipped through that. Uh, reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. Nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance, but God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. Therefore, my beloved, run. Keep far, far away from any sort of idolatry that includes loving anything more than God or participating in anything that leads to sin and enslaves the soul. Paul goes on to encourage the Corinthian church to say, God will deliver us from temptation. And even as we come to God with this honest repentance in front of him, he is willing to deliver us. When we direct our humanness, our struggles to God, when we tell him, God, uh, these are some things I'm really struggling by, come through. I need your help. God's willing to help. Today, uh, as a parent, I will go to any extent to make sure I help my kids so that they become a better versions of themselves. Not that I'll save them from situations or something that they've done wrong, but I will go out to make sure that they become better versions. And God wants us to be better at who he has created us to be so that we don't uh, become changed to so many things. God wants us to live this unshackled life so that we can bring glory to his name. And that comes from a place of real repentance. So today, even as we read from this, will we be standing like the tax collector saying, God, this is me. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Help me, Lord. And God's willing to help us. The second form of real repentance is where it just doesn't come from a mouth, but actually it comes from a heart. 
the conviction happens within our heart and out of that conviction we declare it with our mouth everything that we mean many a times today um I, it's, it's interesting i'm bringing a lot of um examples of my kids because that's a real life example they fight and then we tell them say sorry to each other and that saying sorry so that they'll make us as parents feel better but they don't mean it you know if i've seen so many times when our uh, both the youngest have to say sorry they'll turn the other direction they in fact will be saying sorry to the wall they in fact can't even tell the other person to their face they're sorry that's how much that you know they want to say sorry just with their mouths and not with their heart and often times we in fact i wouldn't say often times many times we say that you know we um we go to god and say god i'm really sorry you know what uh, i shouldn't have done this but i'm really sorry and we just we just have that it's like a, a quick reply you know uh, if you notice a lot of our messaging apps right now have quick replies you have shortcut or hotkeys where you press that hotkey there's a quick reply so that you don't have to be typing it out again we often do that to god when it comes to repentance but in all honesty can we say god i want a heart change because when i know when there's a heart change everything that comes out of my mouth will be real we are weighed by what actually uh, what transformation happens in our heart god weighs that god knows every intention god knows every desire and so we, we can make a lot of claims but they might be more false claims than actually real claims because our heart will be in another place reading from psalm 51 verses 14 to 17 it says deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed o god you are god my savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness open my lips lord and my mouth will declare your praise you do not delight in sacrifice or i would bring it you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings my sacrifice o god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart god you will not despise reading 17 again my sacrifice of god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart god will not despise today how many of us can say that we have our moments of where we are able to go or when we worship god that you know we are actually meaning it from our heart this real repentance that we want to do will lead us to this place of intimate and desperate worship to god and that automatically will, will come from a place not just our mouth our mouth won't be just be declaring it but it'll come from a place of our heart where we really mean everything where we will we will uh, we will really sense god in everything if that is the case what will happen is every bible passage that we read we will actually hear and feel god speaking to us we will really see god working in our heart that change that's bringing every song that we sing in fact we could be even standing uh, it's interesting that i uh, uh, with looking at that example previously where uh, both the pharisee and the tax collector are both standing in uh, a church in a synagogue and they are offering their prayers the two prayers that are offered are two distinctively different prayers when we are standing there in a corporate worship are we really worshiping god and asking god for forgiveness often times we just sing the songs uh, it's it's just so normal for us to just sing our biggest drawbacks are when that guitar solo is not played right we feel we are distracted from worship when we feel like our favorite worship leader is not reading we feel our heart is not set you know in the right place for worship no in this intimate worship our focus is only god our focus is not uh you know on what's happening around us in fact everything that happens around us is to glorify god our worship is about pleasing god the worship that we offer the the serving that we do it's not about us it's about god our repentance is not about us it's about god god paid that huge price on the cross it should have been me but he came down because he loved us and that has to have a heart change it just others there's no difference between us and a mere robot we can program a robot to say what it has to say but god's created us in efficiency it says he's created us so unique that we are called his masterpiece if each of us are his masterpiece we all have a unique way of repenting to god and god delights in that just imagine this there are 6.8 billion people in the world and if each of us are unique just imagine 6.8 unique ways in which people can repent before god they can use their own words they can use you know they are uh the their own heartache their own uh 
the their own groanings of their heart they can put it before god that's what god delights god does not want a cookie cut repentance at this point yes they were all created in fact there are so many prayers that we say and we you know gather around towards repentance because it brings all of us to one framework but when it comes to us individually talking to god it has to be that heart change that happens so that our mouths will declare the right things and say the right things to god so that god will be glorified often times you might say you know what i don't even have the words to repent but god already knows your heart where is your heart so today even as we conclude growing up our biggest fear is we are always scared about the consequences of something bad that we've done that we fail to accept that repentance actually draws us closer repentance draws us closer as a father when my kids repent and when they tell sorry or, or apologize it draws them closer to me i know more about what their heart is or where they are at the more we repent to god god knows where we really are god knows our intentions god knows where our heart is he weighs us in fact it says uh, you know even by all that we do god actually weighs the intentions of our heart so today in real repentance can we direct everything to god and not make it about ourselves we are so good about making everything about ourselves but when it comes to repentance let me let us make it about god because we have sinned against god we've done something wrong by god and god wants us to direct it towards him so that he can help us because only when he helps us can we actually overcome temptation can we find strength and can we get through this journey and the second thing is can it come from a place of our heart being right with god and not just our mouth even as we conclude i would love to draw our attention to this imagery of the sun we all know that the sun is a big ball of fire and we cannot go closer to the sun because uh, at a distance as we draw closer it the heat will really consume us but when we compare that to actually our life and god let's say jesus is the sun and we are on this pathway to actually get closer to him we want him to consume us and that happens when we draw closer to him what happens is these these um things that are not of his things that are not of god starts peeling off as we draw closer it happens over over our entire life span on this earth we will never attain it in fact paul says in timothy that i am the greatest of sinners even after being this big apostle who authored so many epistles he has to come to this place to say i am a great sinner and the more closer we go to him the more he reveals of what we still have to let go the more that still holds us to our human nature and god wants us to repent so that we can transform to being more what he's called us to be even before we pray and close the service i would love to extend this opportunity for you if you say you don't know this jesus if you feel you are struggling in this journey of life and you are like finding it hard to make the right decisions jesus is willing to come along with you there's no place or no a uh, thing that you do that can scare god away god's bigger than everything and he's in control of everything in fact the the reason why we pray and worship and ask god to take control is so that we'll be able to be overcomers that we wouldn't be you know in this place where we are given into sin and given into hardship of things that are around because of our own uh, desires and today i would like to extend this opportunity jesus is willing to come and be the lord and savior of your life but you just have to open your mouth and confess with your mouth saying that you want him to be the lord and savior and for those of us who are wanting to repent let us also be in an attitude of prayer that even as we say this prayer that we'll be able to accept jesus and direct everything that we feel that we've been directing it to the wrong people or wrong places that we'll be able to direct it towards god can you please repeat this prayer after me loving heavenly father I thank you for this time. Lord, I know I am a sinner. Lord, I know I need you. I believe that you are my savior. You died on the cross for me and I accept you into my life. Come into my life. Take complete control over my heart. I pray that you would be God and savior over my life. help me to walk in your power and strength 
that I can live the life that you've called me to live. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. To hear more messages like this, make sure to subscribe and check out our podcast channel for past episodes. If you like what you are hearing, consider rating us, subscribing and even sharing it with friends. That would really help us. For more content from We Are Zion and to connect with us, go to wearezion.in. Remember, whoever finds Jesus finds life.